Welcome everyone to the Kent City Council Committee of the Whole Meeting. Today is Tuesday, November 10th, 2020. This is a remote meeting due to the coronavirus emergency put in place by the governor. So welcome to anyone that is joining us on Facebook City of Kent or the Kent TV 21 YouTube channel or anyone that um, is calling in this evening from one of the numbers on the agenda. Let's go ahead and get started. Kim, would you please call the roll? Thank you. Council President Troutner? Here. Council Member Boyce? Council Member Fincher? Here. Council Member Kaur? Here. Council Member Larmer? Here. Council Member Michelle? Here. Council Member Thomas? Here. Uh, Council Member Fincher is in attendance. You, you probably just didn't hear her this during roll call. Yeah. And yeah. I have noted the mayor is in attendance also. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kim. And just to note, Council Member Boyce will be joining us. He um, had to update his computer this evening. So he will be joining us very soon. Moving on, um, do we have any changes to the agenda from Council or staff? Yes, Madam President, I'd like to recommend that the council hear item 4G, the info only report on green stormwater infrastructure first, and then go through the rest of the agenda in order. Great, thank you. So we have that one change. Can I have um, a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. All right, a second. 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 All those in favor, please. Uh, any discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Uh, motion approved. Let's move on then. Like I said, we actually have a very large agenda. We have um, department presentations A through the letter V. So um, we will get started with that first presentation, which is information only on the green stormwater infrastructure. And I believe Alex. Uh, Marilla is going to be joining us, but we have a couple special guests this evening. We have Risa and Alicia that are going to be joining us from World Relief Seattle. And also on the line will be Tamina, who will be listening in to answer questions at the end if we need to have those answered. So I just want to welcome you. Um, we've been kind of working through this process to get you um, to one of our meetings to present to us this evening and um, very glad that you could join us and excited to see what you have for us this evening. So welcome. Thank you for the opportunity for letting us present. Hi everyone. Um, this presentation is going to be about green stormwater infrastructure in the city of Kent. And green stormwater infrastructure as a preface is designed to mimic nature and capture rainwater. Some examples of this are rain gardens, cisterns, and biospills. The things that you will see mentioned will be later in the presentation, and we'll be referring to green stormwater infrastructure as GSI. And our goal with this is to actively encourage the installation of GSI in the city of Kent to reduce flooding and water pollution mainly to homeowner and small businesses, but it can be used by anybody. Next slide, please. So hello, good evening. My name is Risa Suho, I'm 19. I'm currently a sophomore at the University of Washington, but I lived in Kent for about seven years now. And I'm one of two project manager interns for World Relief Seattle and Sustainably Ambassadors. And hello, my name is Alicia. I'm a 17 year old running start senior at Kent Meridian High School and Highland Community College. I've been living in, a, in Kent for about 10 years and I'm a project manager intern with RISA. Next slide, please. So what are the problems? If you live in Kent or pass by Kent, you can notice that there's a lot of flooding, especially in the rainy seasons. When it floods in East Hill, it also floods in Kent Kingley and goes down to Mill Creek Middle School and the Creek. I remember when I was at school at Mill Creek, we would go outside for PE and our field would be muddy from the rain and our shoes would get full of more mud and like we'd have to put it back into the gym locker and use it the next day. And that's something that my peers and I went through and it's something that students still are going through today. And through this, it also leads to pollution. Like it says on the slide, Reese's neighborhood, our students and residents in Kent deal with pollution and flooding that flooding brings such as car oil, 
litter, or organic waste, which eventually goes down the drain and into Puget Sound. Next slide. Next slide. <laughs> so problems and solutions are pretty a multifaceted discussion. So the way that we kind of split up the solutions is into this pyramid model right here. So on the bottom, you see awareness and learning. It's on the bottom because it's the easiest step to do, but it's super important because it serves as a foundation for the later categories. So the second level is individual projects. Individual projects in the context of GSI serve as community efforts to improve the living standards in our area, creating localized impact. Individual projects also serve for the third category, they serve as case studies for big impacts, incentives, and policies. Like the name suggests, it has the most widespread impact out of all the categories, but it's also the hardest to carry out because of the scale and also the stakeholders that tend to be involved. If you look at the bullet points on the left, we'll be addressing them later on in this presentation. Next slide, please. And moving forward, we're gonna be looking at solutions, mainly with components, examples, and how we can implement these solutions in our lives. Next slide, please. First, we're addressing everybody's favorite subject, glacial till soil. So like the name suggests, glacial till soil is a mixture of various uh, soil deposits that have been deposited by moving glaciers that have been shaking and shimmying around, changing the type of soil in our region. And why this is super important to Kent is because Kent is a region that used to be covered in glaciers. So that means that we are on glacial till soil. And the significance to GSI, green stormwater infrastructure, to glacial till soil is that glacial till soil can absorb some water, but it's not effective enough to properly filter or mitigate water like other soils. Next slide, please. And when thinking about GSI implementation, we have to understand that soil is not able to be done on every site, especially with glacial till soil. Yet we have rain garden soil that allows for water to be captured instead of ponding and becoming rainwater runoff and is more effective than the soil that we naturally have. We would just need to test the soil on site and every little bit of GSI would help in the city of Kent. Next slide, Next please. Slide. <laughs> so the first example that we have of various GSI solutions that can be in implemented in Kent is Paradise Parking Plots on Hillside Church started by the amazing Tamina Martelli. And guess what? Because it's in Kent, it's built on glacial till soil. Here's the first method of GSI. It's rainwater harvesting. If you look, it's four, four, gal four cisterns of 4,000 gallons, which is a lot, and it mitigates water from the hillside church rooftop. The second method is a rain garden, which holds and filters rainwater from the parking lot. Last but not least is the bioswale, which functions just like a rain garden, but it's much more engineered, and it pulls a double duty by further mitigating the flooding that is going to go to Mill Creek. Next slide, please. So another example of GSI is the upcoming Kent Meridian Rain Garden and Cistern. This is located up the hill from Mill Creek on 256th Street. It was started by me, Risa, and our Environmental Club advisor. Shout out to the Environmental Club because they are watching. Um, and it's, it's still an ongoing process. It was designed by the club and we amassed $35,000 in grants from Waterworks and City Council to create the CGSI. But as students, when we were designing this, it was difficult to find information about policies in the city of Kent to support what we were doing and that there were incentives for any of us. So we understand the difficulty residents could be having with wanting to help, but not seeing anything in place that would push them to make action happen. Next slide, please. Speaking of policies and incentives, here are a few examples of different cities that have their own incentives and programs. One of them is King County, which happens to include Kent. So what do all these programs have in common? Well, they're all easily accessible on their respective websites, and the information itself that's available is in language that's understandable and palatable to regular community members and not just developers. So it's easily accessible and the information is understandable. Next slide, please. And speaking of examples, Paradise Parking Plots has created a stormwater drainage fee reduction proposal as an example policy that can be implement implemented in the city of Kent. 
It shows the appropriate incentives in creating GSI in relation to reducing impervious surface fees. Since rain gardens and cisterns add a lot of different faucets to prevent polluted stormwater from entering our drains. So in addition to how much the impervious surface is removed, it also counts how much water is saved from pollution, which goes into the Puget Sound. Next slide, please. Cool. So at every category, there was one problem that was always apparent, and it was the level of awareness that the public had for the problems and solutions regarding GSI. We acknowledge that there are definitely resources available, but they're super hard for people to access when th the resources themselves aren't readily available to the public. Some things that can be done is updating the Kent City website, not only supporting and giving more resources to the programs and policies that already are available and expanding the targeted demographics for these programs. So we're all citizens of Kent, so we're all impacted by the issues that impact Kent, like flooding and pollution. So we should all have equal access to these resources. Next slide, please. So what can we do? We can encourage the community to invest in GSI by invent incentivizing GSI, spreading awareness of GSI, and supporting policies and programs that support GSI. So Kent is a highly urbanized city, and fun fact, it's the 10th most ethno-racial diverse city in the U.S. Our students and our citizens deserve to have a safe and healthy environment where we minimize the damage of flooding and pollution. So Alicia and I, we know about GSI, but we still found it hard to find resources in the city of Kent. But we can take steps in the right direction. So you as city council members, you can incentivize and support policies towards GSI, but all of us can support GSI in Kent by spreading awareness and participating in the creation of these projects. Thank you everyone for listening and we're free to ask questions or answer questions. Thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. I see some hands raised, so I'm gonna to turn to my colleagues first and I'll start with Council Member Kaur. Thank you. Thank you, Alicia and Risa for this great presentation and thank you for educating us. Uh, I've been to the hillside plots many times, so great kudos to Tamina and the team for a very innovative project that she's worked on. Um, I, I agree, we need to be making it more accessible. Information needs to be really readily available for our community. So. Maybe it's something we can look into. So thank you so much for coming and uh, sharing this with us. Great comments. Thank you, Council Member Michaud. Thank you, Council President. I agree with Council Member Cora. That's a great presentation and shout out to the Environment Mental Club at KM. Really appreciate that today. So thanks for coming. Council Member Larmer. Um, Until and, this is not my computer. And I just want to say that I would support um, the council taking a look at any type of policies um, around this. You know, maybe there's things we can do at the city level, things we can encourage up our homeowners, and you know, anything we can do that you know seems fairly simple, not simple, but you know, pretty straight, straightforward ideas for um, reducing pollution to our waterways. And I would support anything um, for that objective. So thank you for bringing this to our attention. Thank you, Councilmember Larmer. Um, Councilmember Fincher, I believe you have your hand up. I just can't quite see it, but go ahead if you have a question. Thank you, Council President. I would also support a policy. Hold on. I would also support a policy uh, uh, supporting GSI. And I'd like to ask that possibly we have our Public Works Department look into seeing if we can incentivize uh, GSI within the city, since it would behoove all of us and benefit our ratepayers, as well as just in there, and so it would help out the environment and our climate altogether. Are you guys able to hear those echoes? Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. 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 <laughs> What you're saying and I are in the same room, so it's going to be a bit of a problem. But anyway, I'd like to have our public works department look into uh, 
some sort of incentive so that people who are putting forth the extra effort, I happen to garden at Paradise, and there's a lot of work up there done with the removing of the pavement, and we know that the school is going to go into it, so if we can get more people doing uh, such projects, it's going to only benefit our groundwater here, saving us less work on the other end. I will be right back. I'm going to see if we can do something about the sound. Thank you, Councilmember Fincher. Councilmember Thomas. Thank you, Madam President. Great presentation, but I would expect nothing less from my two alma maters, UW and Kent Meridian. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Thomas. Any other questions, Councilmember Boyce? You have your mic off. Did you want to say something? Yeah, just a quick comment. I came in on the tail end. One thing I did hear from both of the, one of the speaker is is talking about the communication and uh, people not knowing about it. So this really gave us opportunity again for our communication team to really, uh, you know, where it's to our website or however, right? You know, help spread the word and uh, and let the community know about this here. So another opportunity for our communication team. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Royce. Um, great job again. Alicia and Risa, um, you've given us some things to think about and some things to talk about as a council. So um, wonderful job, and we appreciate you being here with us. So thank you so much. All right, and as long as there is nothing else, I don't see any other hands raised, we will go ahead and move on in the agenda. All right, up next I have information only. We'll start with the Milk Creek Canyon cleanup and then um, we will move on to the action item. All right, thank you, Council President. Um, I'm Brian Levenhagen. I'm here to talk about Milk Creek Canyon cleanup project uh, and then uh, um, an amendment to our current contract to um, with the contractor uh, to clean up Milk Creek Canyon um, after the information only item. Uh, next slide. So I, I really can't think of anything more appropriate um, for Mill Creek Canyon Earthworks Park to, than to follow that great presentation by Alicia and Risa uh, on green stormwater infrastructure. Um, not everyone knows, but Mil Earthworks Park was one of the first um, green infrastructure projects ever built in this country. It really kicked off an entire movement. Um, so it's just really um, appropriate to, to, to follow that. Um, and I think as, as we look to the future of Mill Creek Canyon, it, we would definitely like to, um, as we look at renovating Earthworks Park and other portions of the canyon, again, bring it back to the forefront of green stormwater uh, infrastructure. Um, you know, here you can see kind of some of the, the historical um, significance of Mill Creek Canyon. On the top left, you can see the old springboard notch and the cedar stump. On the top right, you can see an old dam that exists in the canyon. Um, it's a tremendous uh, asset uh, for, for recreation, for history. Um, in the lower left, you can see some of the various examples of how this park has been significant, um, played a significant cultural role in our city, um, whether it's concerts, whether it's people getting married, whether it's um, festivals or um, the Seattle Symphony Orchestra performing there. Um, and then uh, it really is, it's, a, it's an amazing asset to have a natural canyon um, with a salmon bearing creek running through it, right, you know, dead center uh, in our city, um, connecting the East Hill to downtown. And the top photo, you can see this is from the early 80s, a, a, Cub, a Cub Scout troop going for a hike. And you can see the kids are, you know, getting their hands dirty, um, experiencing nature. So Mill Creek Canyon's an extremely important recreational amenity. We're looking forward to, you know, after we move through this cleanup process to um, starting the master planning process and looking for ways to reinvigorate it. Um, so before we moved into the cleanup, I wanted to kind of just, again, remind everyone how important this asset is to everyone um, and, and as a recreational asset and what it, what it has meant to the city and what it can mean to the city. So next slide. So we uh, obviously we've been trying to clean up the canyon for some time now. And, and last year we, we, or I guess this year we got funding to, to do so. Um, as we approached this project, it wasn't really, we weren't really um, clear on how the best way to do it was. Obviously, it's a very challenging terrain. You can see on the left, um, that's a, a, a topographical map of, of the canyon. You can see most of the slopes along here are over 40%, which is pretty much straight up and down. So it's not a not a site where you can just go out with pick sticks or, and, and clean up. Uh, it's definitely a very challenging site. Uh, last June, we, uh, we sent out an RFQ um, to 
see who would respond and, and who does this type of cleanup efforts. Um, we got one respondent and that was Clean, Clean Harbors and that's the company we ended up uh, contracting with here. Um, COVID delayed our ability to get started, but uh, we started the project in, in mid, mid, uh, sorry, mid-September. And the way we, we decided to, to approach it was to delineate an area and here you can see what we called area one, um, about 500 feet long, um, just down the canyon from the American Legion Hall and uh, we, we, again, we, we didn't, weren't sure what the best way to approach this was. So we started with a, a small contract for $80,000 to, to clean it up. And uh, we worked, talked through, through, through with the consultant and, and uh, got started. Um, next slide. So here you can see uh, a couple pictures of, of what this um, steep slopes and this the canyon looked like. Um, the, the picture on the left really doesn't do the how steep this um, area is justice, but essentially there's a flat area on top that's maybe 50 feet wide, then it drops off about 100 feet to another flat area, and then it's about another 150 feet down to the canyon uh, floor where the creek is. And um, yeah, I know these pictures look bad, but uh, just from my experience going out there, the pictures don't actually do it justice, um, just how much garbage had accumulated in these areas. Um, next slide. So this is this is a picture from early in the cleanup. You can see it. They they started with the flat areas. They started bagging things up. Hey. Started um, checking in quickly before I go into my first meeting. They started uh, uh, gathering up shopping carts. You can see the, all the needles they they being collecting. Um, but uh, they still weren't weren't entirely clear on how to, how to approach the slopes. And so next slide. So here you can see um, what they ended up doing is, is roping themselves off, wearing harnesses, uh, rappelling down the, down the steep slopes. And it really didn't make sense to try to pick up the garbage on the slope and bring it back up, um, you know, one trip down the, the slope at a time. And so what they ended up doing is they, they ended up throwing all the garbage down to the next flat spot and then gathering it up and then using a cable and pulley system to bring it back up to the top. It was uh, something that once they figured it out, they've gotten better and better at it, and uh, it's turned out to be uh, you know the most efficient way, and and really worked out well for them. Next slide. And so here you see a couple after photos of that first uh, area one cleanup area that we uh, saw. Um, you can see just night and day, and I can say just from my experience, I went out there when they just started working, and then I went out there again when they finished this area, and just the, the difference was amazing and one of the more satisfying things I've ever seen in a, you know, on a project that uh, um, I had a hand in. Um, just uh, an amazing amount of work went into this, um, and just, again, just the, the idea that we can just uh, take clean up such a, a difficult environment. Um, and again, we pulled 200 cubic yards of trash out of there, 70 shopping carts just in this one area, um, a, a 20 gallon container of needles, um, and about 20 days of work for group six. Next slide. So um, after we finished area one, we moved on to area two. We signed an amendment with the contractor to keep them working. Uh, we were really pleased with the, the, the progress that they made. Um, we have our, uh, Project manager, Brian Higgins, who has done an amazing job working with the contractor, keeping them moving. He's been out there almost every day. Garen Lee has been out there, um, you know, not quite that much, but but frequently as well, um, just overseeing the work and, and, you know, again, solving problems as they come up. Um, just a tremendous amount of progress has, has been made. Area 2 work is wrapping up there. They're... Um, as we, as I mentioned before, the the, the process of this, this next amendment um, is uh, is a not to exceed amendment for five hundred forty five thousand um, dollars, but we we don't necessarily have to spend that. We're going to continue the same approach we've taken the entire time. What well, what we do is um, Brian delineates an area that we need to have cleaned up, and then we ask the Clean Harbors for a proposal, and then they submit that to us, and we review it with them. And then um, you know prior to moving on to another area, we make sure that they actually follow through on what they did there. So it's been a good proce uh, process for us and it's allowed us to kind of, um, you know, keep a good track of, of their work and uh, keep them on target. Um, so that's uh, the approach that we look at using um, moving forward. Um, 
when we did area one, we, we had PD and human services go out and um, contact any um, and camp people in the work in the you know, had encampments out there. We were able to get the majority of those people into services. Um, so that was a really positive thing right off the bat. And uh, we continue that through uh, the rest of the project, um, have our PD and human services following our encampment protocol uh, when necessary. Um, and, and again, offering services and, and trying the best to, to help anyone um, that uh, again has an encampment there. Um, so our hope is that we intend, we sign an amendment to Clean Harbors to continue the cleanup efforts. Um, and I know that one of the big questions about all this is, you know, how are we gonna prevent this from happening again I think what, we, what we've seen is that uh, there, there's a significant cost to not keeping it maintained. And so we have some of the, the 2021 funds for Mill Creek Canyon cleanup set aside to hire some seasonal staff to regularly go out and uh, make sure that um, pick up any additional litter or garbage that's found, um, you know, and just kind of, again, keep a closer eye on this area. Similarly to the overall cleanup efforts, we're not entirely sure um, the best a way to approach this. Um, so it'll be a bit of a work in progress, but uh, we're gonna, you know, again, we're gonna start with a regular presence out there um, and, and go from there. So um, that includes, that concludes my um, presentation here and I'll answer any questions um, about any of this. Thank you so much, Brian. Council Member Thomas, you have your hand raised. Yes, thank you, Madam President. Brian, I got it. First of all, I've got to compliment you uh, and the group from Clean Harbors, I drive by there every day and, and I see a significant difference already, just what I could visually see. Today, I was driving by area three and uh, I guess yesterday, there was two dumpsters out there. <clears throat> Today, there's one and these guys are really going at it and uh, it's it's amazing. But you've hit the highlight uh, as far as what what do we need to do after this is all cleaned up? Because the last thing you want to do is have it, you know, as bad as it is right now, uh, ever come back again. And so I don't know what can be done, cameras or whatever, but something, we've got to be creative on this one. And I want to thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Uh, Go ahead, yeah, Brian. Just to, uh, to expand on that a little bit, um, you know, I think clean, keeping it clean is one is one step. Um, I think the the next step is activating the canyon, right, and getting people back out there um, to enjoy it. Um, you know, because that that's really the purpose of Mill Creek Canyon Park. It's it's to to allow people to um, connect with nature, to um, you know, to to walk their dog. Um, so it really it all comes down to positive activation, and that's where the next step. You know, reinvesting into the canyon. We're going to try to find some easy wins and 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 improving loop trail opportunities. Potentially looking at other improvements like off leash dog areas or just golf courses. Things that we know that are are, are pretty simple um, that will immediately get used. Uh, this is all going to be there's going to be a public process involved in this as well before we move into that. But that that's kind of again tentatively what we're what we're looking at once the cleanup phase is complete. Councilmember Michaud, do you have a question? Thank you, Council President. Brian, I just want to say this presentation is great. Um, the pictures that I've seen are just amazing, and this is such important work. So I'm really happy to see that we're continuing with that. Thank you. Councilmember Larmer. Thank you. Um, have we, Brian, have we seen any um, movement towards the encampments moving back into to area one now that we moved on to area two? Have we seen any action there? And is there anything we need, uh, anything we're doing to prevent that currently? I'm not, I'm not aware that there have been any um, encampments moved back into area one. I know that, again, we are, our staff has a regular presence out there. Um, and, you know, and we'll follow proper procedures uh, in the event that there are encampments back in those areas. Um, so, yeah. So, yeah, we haven't had any, I just got confirmation, we haven't had any camps in Area 1. Okay, uh, thank so you. It's been, it's been pretty successful. We've been really happy Good. with how we're doing. Sounds great. That's a lot of work. So, thank you for that. Thank you so much. Any other questions for Brian? 
All right, Brian, do you want to go ahead and move on with the action item? Yeah. Um, so we're asking um, for to give the mayor authorization to sign the second amendment to the Clean Harbors uh, contract that will authorize spending up to four hundred fifty or five hundred forty-five thousand uh, dollars, and again, that's that's a not to exceed. Um, so we were hoping not to spend that much money, um, and we will take continue to take it area by area. It gives us a lot of uh, just um, uh, control over the process, and so. Um, but uh, it's worked out so far. I don't know any other questions uh, on, on that amendment or? Quick question. Right. Uh, Brian, how, uh, did we have money left over from the last time that we didn't use? So we have a li we have a little bit unspent right now um, that we're anticipating on that being um, spent in the next few weeks. Um, so uh, th this amendment will allow Clean Harbors to keep working. Roughly, how much you have left over? Just curious. So the first area, I think, ended up costing a little more than a hundred thousand um, dollars. So the the initial contract um, was two hundred fifty five thousand um, dollars. So the first area was a little over a hundred thousand dollars. The second area uh, ended up being a little uh, north of eighty thousand um, dollars. And then the third area we anticipate will will take a little more than the two hundred fifty five thousand dollars. It's already um, been. Uh, in the contract, so um, we, we have a, we have maybe you know I don't, we don't have an exact figure because billing comes in a little slow, it's a little behind. Um, okay, so think of you, couple twenty thirty grand maybe. Thank you. All right. Any other questions for Brian on moving this or? So this would be, this is the amendment for um, Clean Harbors Environmental Services for Mill Creek Cleanup. Um, are there any objections from my colleagues for moving this to the consent calendar? All right, we will go ahead and move that. We will move that on to consent. Thank you so much, everyone. All right, moving on in the agenda, I'm going to welcome Terry Youngman to talk about, oops, sorry, my agenda, to talk about um, 2020 second and third quarter fee and lieu funds, and this is action as well. Uh, good evening, uh, council members and mayor. Thank you for having me tonight. Uh, I am here to present to you the Q2 and Q3 fee and lieu cases. Um, uh, we are moving to recommend council accept $14,250 in fee and lieu funds. Uh, this amends the community parks reinvestment program budget uh, and authorizes the future expenditure of these funds for capital improvements at campus park. Uh, this is the park we identified as being the closest park to where the cases were generated that has a capital project uh, in the foreseeable future in the next one to two years so that we do not uh, put these funds at risk of being uh, <clears throat> given back to the developer. Um, so between April 1st and September 30th, uh, City of Kent received a total of 14250 uh, from the data homes developer for a subdivision of six lots. Um, the, those fees were paid um, as mitigation for the development of homes on the local subdivision. Um, and so we will be holding these in reserve until the campus park project is ready for uh, construction and capital expenditure. Um, there is a map attached uh, that shows where the cases were developed and the parks in the area, and you will see Campus Park on that map. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. All right. Any questions for Terry? All right. I'm not seeing any hands raised. Is there any objection to moving this forward to consent? All right. I am not seeing any, so we will go ahead and do that. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Terry. Moving on in the agenda, next we have an action item for the jail medical services agreement. Hi, I'm Diana McHouston. I'm the jail commander, and I'm here tonight to talk to you about inmate medical care, specifically the jail medical services contract. Um, as you know, when an inmate comes in to the facility, um, at the city of Kent, the law requires that we attend to their medical needs. They're not free to obtain their own medical care, so it's a responsibility falls on the city's shoulders, and that's under the Constitution. Um, unfortunately, the medical needs of inmates are high, 
it's generally a population with medical needs that require immediate attention when they enter the facility. Over the past decade, we've seen a significant increase in medical issues surrounding drug addiction. Um, a little bit of history about our uh, jail medical services contract. For over the past 20 years, we've contracted with Valley Medical Occupational Services. Um, they've provided uh, the medical care for our inmates. This past spring, Valley notified us that they were leaving correction medicines and um, our contract will end with them in December 31st of this year. Um, so over the past six months, we've worked with our legal team, Bajan, Pat, and Kim to put together a RFP, uh, which went out on June 5th and it closed July 29th. We received just one candidate proposal when that went out. We decided to go ahead and extend the RFP for 30 days and we increased our advertising efforts and that one closed on August 28th. Um, out of that RFP, we received three candidates that put in proposals to do jail medical services. Uh, the first one was Ideal Options. They're a company that's located in Pasco, Washington. They were founded in 2012 and they specialize in addiction clinics, the medicated assistant treatment, and they partner with jails for that program. Um, they are new to correctional medicine though. Their proposal was submitted for $575,000 and they were our lowest bid. The next one was Healthcare Deliveries. They're also a local company. They're out of Tumwater, Tumwater, Washington, and they started in correctional medicine in local facilities in 1997. Their bid came in the middle at 628,000. The last company that submitted a proposal is called WellPath. They're a national company out of Nashville, Tennessee. They have 37 years of experience in the industry and they have contracts in 33 states for prisons and state facilities and city facilities. Um, their proposal came in at 857,000. So there was a pretty wide range. It was about a $300,000 difference between the low end and the high end. Um, from, um, from there, we went to an interview process on September 23rd, we held interviews for each one of the candidates. Uh, the interview panel consisted of seven people. We brought in two people from Valley, the Valley Medical Director, the Jail Administrator from Valley, Assistant Chief Kasner, myself, a Corrections Administrator Officer, um, Pat Fitzpatrick, and Bajan Hughes was all on the interview panel. Let's see, after that, the decision process um, of which candidate we wanted to go with was the things that we took into consideration was definitely budget, how it impacted the police department and the city. We looked at experience in correctional medicine. We felt that that was something that was very important. important. Um, we looked at the proximity of the vendors, uh, the local versus the national, and, and the benefits of that. We also looked at the financial stability of each of the candidates and the compatibility with, the, uh, with their program and how it met the facility's needs. After we took everything into consideration, we decided to go with healthcare deliveries um, they currently provide services in six local facilities to include the Puyallup Jail, Thurston County, Mason County, Mason County Juvenile Facility, Olympia Jail, and Jefferson County. Um, again, their proposal came in at $628,000. They're going to start with a uh, staffing level that will be reduced due to COVID. It'll reflect 12-hour shifts rather than 16-hour shifts. So there will be a lower financial obligation to start the contract. Some of the other highlights of the contract is it's a five-year contract 
with no increases for the first three years. They're bringing in electronic medical records um, that uh, the system we will keep either if either uh, either provider decides to leave the contract, we will keep the electronic medical records system. They built a medicated assistant treatment program into the contract. We currently subcontract for those services, which we're obligated to provide. Um, they also are bringing mental health telemed. Um, we'll have on-site and mental health telemed, which will expand our mental health um, medical services. They're hoping to keep our current nurses, which would make a really easy transition. And Valley Medical has agreed to stay for two weeks at the end of December. So both um, healthcare deliveries and Valley Medical will work for two weeks together to help with the transition. So that is all that I have. Great, thank you. Are there any questions on this agreement? All right, I'm not seeing any hands raised. Um, this is an agreement for jail medical services. Um, any objection to moving this forward to consent? All right, seeing none, we will put that on the consent calendar. Thank you so much. We are going to continue on in the agenda and I believe up next, I know it says Mike McTutis, but I believe Alex Merlo is joining us for the USGS annual agreement, and this is also an action item. Hi, thank you, uh, Council President Troutner, uh, Mayor Ralph, Council Members, Alex Murillo, um, Engineering Supervisor and Public Works, good evening. Thank you for having me. And I'm gonna allow Kim to pull up the presentation and we'll get ready for that. Thank you, Kim. And uh, so today I have before you in a, an annual agreement with the U.S. Geological Service to operate and maintain a number of our critical gauges along the Green River, Kent Valley Creeks, and along Rock Creek in the Clark Springs watershed. Altogether, there's eight of these gauges. Uh, the photo here on this first slide shows two of the gauges. The left photo is at South 200 Street with the existing gauge over the Green River. And then the photo on the right is one of our new gauges installed recently there at South 277th Street uh, on the south end of Kent near Auburn. And the next slide, uh, heading east uh, into our Clark Springs watershed along Rock Creek, east of Maple Valley. Uh, we do have two gauges out there along Rock Creek uh, as shown in this, this slide. Again, this is east of Maple Valley in our Clark Springs watershed. And then in the next slide, uh, zooming back into the Kent Valley, uh, maybe a figure more familiar to you. Uh, there's uh, a gauge here at South 200 Street, as well as uh, two gauges along Mill Creek uh, near 180th Street and Earth Forks Park down in the south end of Kent. And then they're, they're along Springbrook Creek, again, on the northern part of the Kent city limits. This next slide shows an example of the data we're able to retrieve from the USGS gauges. Uh, we had the high water event in February, uh, certainly an event that concerned us. And the red curve uh, shows the gauge reading at the USGS river gauge in Auburn. Uh, and then the green um, curve shows the reading at the USGS gauge at South 200 Street um, in Kent. So again, the river flows from south to north. And if you look closely, um, you can see there's a pattern in the way that the peak flows move from the south end of the, of, of the river to the north as flows move downstream. So peeking at the curves, uh, you'll notice that the Auburn gauge, when there's a peak, uh, then the peak follows, shown in green at South 200 Street. And then uh, conversely, when the flow drops at the Auburn gauge, you'll see, uh, shown in red, then you'll see that the flow drops at South 200 Street, um, again, following that pattern. The next slide shows two new gauges we've installed in between those two locations, again, to give us better data 
uh, particularly during a flood event. event. Uh, the gauge here is at Meeker Street Bridge, as well as another one at South 277th Street Bridge. So again, the two uh, red triangles indicating the new locations, and then the, the orange triangles showing uh, both the South 200th Street gauge and then the Auburn gauge uh, to the south. Again, here's on the next slide, another example of some of the data uh, that can be retrieved from the USGS gauges. Uh, this one in particular is at South 200th Street. Now, uh, weather watchers or river enthusiasts can peek at the data provided from any of the USGS gauges uh, by connecting to this website, or perhaps the more convenient way, just typing in USGS gauges Kent Washington into your favorite search engine or browser, and you'll, you'll be able to navigate all of the available resources provided by the USGS gauges. So in the next slide, you'll see uh, the breakdown in the funding to maintain and operate the gauges for uh, fiscal year 2021. And uh, you can see Kent pays a larger portion of the cost, but some of the costs are shared between the USGS and Tequila. And in the next slide, uh, kind of my closing slide. So beyond the novelty of the data, including water surface elevation flows, uh, flow rates and precipitation, all of the data provided by the USGS gauges are necessary and critical in our work along the Green River um, to protect uh, and also our projects along the Valley Creeks and east into Clark Springs watershed, all to reduce flood risk and to improve salmon habitat. So thank you for your time and your continued support of our projects. Thank you so much, Alex. Any questions or comments from colleagues? All right, so the motion before us is for the annual agreement with USGS. Any objections? All right, we will move that forward. Thank you so much. We are going to back up. My apologies. I skipped over an item, and that's what happens when we get things moved around. Um, recycling surcharge adjustment. Um, so, Rowena, I believe you are going to present this evening. Welcome, and I apologize for skipping over you. No worries. Uh, that's all right. Uh, good afternoon, City Council members, Department Liaisons and Committee. I'm Rowena Valencia Dica. I'm the Environmental Supervisor at the Public Works Engineering Division. And this afternoon, I'll be presenting about another surcharge increase being requested by the city's contracted hauler, Republic Services. Next slide, please. You have already heard about the China sword so many times. And by now, uh, so I'd like to give you all a refresher. In January 2018, China shut its doors to accept recyclable materials being shipped uh, from various countries. And across the globe, including the US local governments and recycling uh, processors have since been scrambling to find new markets uh, for, <coughs> for their recyclable materials and uh, to also find alternative solutions. And such policy also resulted in the reduction in recyclable uh, commodity values. Next slide, please. In response to the recycling market dynamics, Republic has implemented some changes, including slow processing lines for better sorting of recyclables, and they also hired additional uh, personnel to ensure there will be uh, uncontaminated product. And as such, Republic asked uh, partner cities, including the city of Kent, to put a surcharge on customers to pass on the increased cost of recycling due to contamination and to offset the lower profits from reduced commodity values. Next slide, please. So last year, Republic requested a rate adjustment or surcharge to the city of Kent to recoup such additional costs. This resulted in an amendment to the contract. And the amendment included the following conditions. The surcharge will need to be re-evaluated annually and provides for a 30-day public notification in the original contract, it was set at 90 days, but was changed to 30 days so that it will match with the annual rate adjustment. And I'll discuss the details of the surcharge increase being requested uh, in a few minutes. Contract was also extended to expire in 2029 instead of 2023. And this allows the city to take advantage of the very competitive 
rate uh, being offered by the public, and that provides for a low rate for our customers for a long period of time. In the amendment, our list of recyclables was also modified to remove problematic contaminants or non-recyclables from the blue bin, such as plastic bags, hubcaps, carpenters, and side view mirrors, among others. We also redefined contamination. That is, uh, we changed the percent of what is considered contaminated from 20% to 10%. That means if there is 10% or higher of any items that are incorrectly placed in your garbage can or recyclable or food and yard waste bins, then the bin will be considered contaminated. The contaminated containers should then be flagged by uh, the public. Lastly, the development and implementation of a contamination reduction program is also required in the amendment. Next slide, please. And here are the components of the contamination reduction program. Customer education, monthly monitoring and documentation of contamination rate, increased reporting of contamination rate, enforcement of, an, of measures so that we can reduce contamination, procedures for resuming recycling when garbage service was suspended due to contamination, enhanced communication and outreach, and lastly, annual inspections and reporting of tracks at the materials recycling facility. Surcharge should also go together with the implementation of a strong contamination reduction program. The public should have started its contamination reduction program implementation back in the beginning of January 2020. Republic as of today is still working on getting this implemented. If Republic can implement a strong contamination reduction program, the surcharge can actually be eliminated. This is because all such steps are expected to result in much less, if not completely eliminating contamination in the recycling materials. This is expected to increase commodity values that would then offset the extra processing costs. Such steps could even result in commodity gains that will translate to customer rebates. Next slide, please. Here's the initial surcharge that took into effect on September 1, 2019. For single family, it's 96 cents per month, and for multi-family and cart-based customers, it's $2.98 per cubic yard of garbage per month. Next slide, please. The new recycling, the, the amendment allows for Republic services to request sustainability adjustment in February of this year. This request was received in February 2020, but due to COVID and other more pressing priorities of the city, as well as discussions on the details of the request, the city staff just now had the opportunity to present it to the council. So the new recycling processing surcharge rates being requested are $1.29 per month for single family and $5.83 per cubic yard of garbage per month for multi-family. This new surcharge equates an increase of $0.33 cents a month or a 33% increase from the existing surcharge for single family. For multi-family, this equates an increase of $2.85 cents per cubic yard per month, or a 96% increase to the previous surcharge. Please note that these rates include both the commodity values and processing costs. As mentioned earlier, the amendments specify that there will be annual re-evaluation of the surcharge. If the new rate being requested is greater than or equal to 5%, it will need council approval and hence this presentation today. Processing costs may also be considered, but not required. If commodity revenue exceeds the baseline established in June 2019, customers may receive a rebate instead of paying the adjustment. And lastly, it is required that the contractor will develop and implement a strong contamination reduction program. Uh, that's the end of my presentation. Thank you, and let me know if you have questions or clarifications. Thank you very much. Lots of information there. Any questions or comments about this? All right, I'm not seeing any hands raised. Um, so this is for um, authorizing the recycling surcharge adjustment. Any objections to moving this forward to the consent calendar? 
All right, seeing none, we will move it forward to consent. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Rowena. Thank you. All right, and getting back on track, I'd like to welcome April. This is information only, and it is an update on the transportation master plan draft project list. Good evening. So thank you for having me tonight to present on the draft trans transportation master plan project list. Next slide, please. Before we go over the project list, I wanna revisit the capital budget to provide a financial context on the prioritized funding list. Next slide, please. A capital budget is composed of four funding sources, the business and occupation tax, grants and appropriations, transportation impact fees, and project specific local improvement districts or LIDs. Next slide, please. The forecasts on this slide are based on historic funding data for all but LIDs, which are a project specific financing tool. The forecast is split into a low, a mid, and a high estimate. Over the 20 year horizon of the TMP, the 145, 41 million is available for capital projects in the low forecast, 198 million point five million for the mid forecast, and 256 million for the high forecast. The total estimated cost of the draft prioritized project list is between the mid and the high forecast. Next slide, please. The draft project list was heavily informed by public feedback. In fall 2019, the public submitted projects for the TMP, and in fall of 2020, the public gave feedback on which project corridors and projects should be prioritized. Next slide. Oh, you're on the right one. <laughs> Public feedback on priority projects and project corridors received via the web map and online survey were combined with feedback from interviews and workshops and from feedback from staff. This feedback was then reviewed from the aspect of the capital budget, as well as with consideration for individual project funding. The results of the feedback and budget analysis was the draft prioritized project list. Next slide, please. Staff received additional feedback that was not specific to the top 37 project quarters and 120 projects. This additional feedback fell in primarily four categories, pedestrian crossing improvements, pedestrian facilities near schools, pedestrian facilities near transit, especially high capacity transit, and intersection and signal improvements to decrease congestion. This feedback also informed the project list. Next slide, please. The prioritized projects Projects with secured funding and developer projects are anticipated to be constructed over the 20 year horizon of the plan. Next slide. There are 93 projects on the draft prioritized project list. These projects are highly multimodal, meaning many serve multiple modes such as vehicles, pedestrians, and bicyclists. There are a variety of projects that directly benefit each mode. In addition, there are three programs for safety, safe routes to school, and neighborhood greenways as well as three planning projects. A handout was emailed that included maps that detailed the projects by sub area and by type, as well as a project list with project IDs that correspond with the maps. Over the next couple of slides, I'm gonna go over the feedback from the web map and surveys for each sub area, followed by the projects by sub area. Please feel free to stop me if you have any questions or need clarifications. For the downtown sub area, feedback was relatively consistent between the survey and the web map, with all or portions of James Street, Central Avenue, and Meeker Street prioritized high. Next slide, please. The projects over the 20 years of the TMP reflect much of what was heard in public outreach, as well as safety and non-motorized projects essential to meet the adopted transportation master plan goals. Next slide. Public feedback prioritized projects on South 212th Street and the Veterans 224-228 corridor in the Manufacturing Industrial Center. Next slide. Projects funded also reflect much of what we heard in the public. In this area, additional projects also include auto safety and non-motorized projects that help us meet those TMP goals. Next slide. Feedback in the Midway sub area highlighted the critical importance of this sub area due to the soon to be open two link light rail stations, Military Road, Wreath Road, South 260th Street, South 259th Place, all scored as a high priority in public feedback. Next slide. The projects funded all over the 20 years reflect this importance of the sub area. 
and information from the web map, surveys, workshops, and interviews also added auto, economic development, safety, and non-motorized projects essential to meet the goals of the TMP. Next slide. The top two quarters for the survey for Northeast Hill were 132nd Avenue Southeast and Southeast 240th Street. Of note, as discussed in the last TMP update, public feedback from interviews and workshops prioritized 132nd Avenue Southeast over 116th Avenue Southeast if funding was only available for one corridor. Next slide. As with previous slides, what we heard in public feedback is really reflected on what you see on this map. In addition, also critical auto safety and non-motorist projects are also reflected on this map. Next slide, please. For the Southeast Hill, public feedback prioritized Southeast Kent Kingley Road, 132nd Avenue Southeast and Southeast 250 Street, Southeast 256th Street, as well as specific projects on Southeast 248th Street. Much of the comments received for this sub area fell within those additional feedback comment categories that I detailed earlier. Next slide. The prioritized projects reflect the corridors that we've seen previously. But in addition, in this area, there was quite a few crossing improvements that really did uh, rise to the top. In addition, notably the TMP goals for safety and health and connectivity and options can really be seen in the projects that were prioritized. Next slide, please. There are two programs on a prioritized project list, each with an initial project list based on the public feedback that we heard. Next slide. The current Safe Routes to School project list is based on public feedback and discussions with local school districts. Staff anticipate further evaluation to identify other critical projects, as well as staff efforts to prioritize projects for funding in the Safe Routes to School program. The current Neighborhood Greenways project list is based on public outreach and serves as the starting point for the funding effort. A Neighborhood Greenways plan is on the prioritized project list. The plan will serve to identify the Neighborhood Greenway network and prioritize projects for funding by the Neighborhood Greenway program. Next slide, please. I anticipate this map to change as critical safe routes to school projects are identified, as well as after the Neighborhood Greenways plan is complete. Next slide, please. The last group of projects are projects that are not prioritized for funding over the 20 year transportation master plan planning horizons. These are projects from the extensive public outreach process and from public feedback. As with the funded project list, the projects are highly multimodal and include projects for each mode. If additional funding is identified for these projects, staff can amend the transportation master plan to include the project on the prioritized project list. The TMP is intended to be a living plan, similar to the Regional Transportation Plan. Kent staff can complete amendments to address changing funding sources and to incorporate emerging transportation issues. Staff will be developing an amendment process in 2021. Next slide. Many of the projects in each sub area will likely be familiar based on previous presentations. Through e though each sub area has additional projects from the categories I detailed earlier, in downtown, as with of all sub areas, some of the project corridors that were on the top list that were going to public outreach were partially funded and partially unfunded. Next slide. An important reason that the unfunded projects are included in the TMP is to ensure that the public feedback and identified projects are documented and keyed up if additional funding is identified. Next slide, please. In Midway, one of the additional comment categories was the importance of pedestrian as well as multimodal access to high capacity transit. An important note in this sub area, the importance of projects in this area was expressed by residents of all sub areas. Next slide, please. Multimodal projects as well as a planning study for the Benson's quarter is on the list for the Northeast Hill. And next slide. On the Southeast Hill, the projects are very multimodal. One note on the Southeast Hill as well as the Northeast Hill sub area, the non-motorized projects are being evaluated to determine any projects should be included on that safe routes to school project list or on the neighborhood greenways project list. Next slide, please. What's next? Staff are looking for council feedback on the draft project list. Additionally, over the next three weeks, Pro the draft project list represented to the Transportation Advisory Board, the Cultural Communities Board, and the Kent Bicycle Advisory Board. Staff are working to refine cost estimates and refine project descriptions. 
And the updated draft project list will be presented at the next Committee of the Whole meeting on December 1st. Additionally, the draft proposed capital budget will also be uh, put into a form and finalized over the next three weeks. And lastly, staff are close to the draft TMP policies and actions after a highly collaborative and interdepartmental effort over the last eight months. Staff will bring these to the committee whole in December. And I'm happy to take questions. Thank you again for that update, April. Any questions for April on this update? All right, April, I don't see any hands raised. I just want to continue to thank you for and your staff for all of the work you're doing, reaching out to people in the community for that input. Um, I think it's really important. And, you know, we get emails often from residents asking about, you know, sidewalks in their area or road, you know, improvements. And I think that um, this process allows people to share that input. So um, it's a lot of work, but you guys are doing a great job and I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Have a great night. Thank you, you too. All right, moving on in the agenda, another information only item, Advance Kent. Well, good afternoon, all council president, council members, uh, mayor, thanks for having me. My name is Michael Mage and I'm your government performance coordinator and Lean Six Sigma Black Belt. Uh, happy to provide this update. Uh, next slide, please. Um, today, I'll be giving you uh, a brief uh, overview of what we've been working on in the year 2020. Uh, I'll give you a quick recap on Advanced Kent, um, a little bit about our Lean um, Employee Training uh, uh, Program, uh, some of the improvement projects that I'd like to highlight uh, so that you're aware of them, and then talk a little bit about performance measures and our plans uh, for performance moving into next year. Next slide, please. So uh, just as a quick recap, Lean is a methodology for continuous business process improvement. Uh, you might recall that it began with Toyota and was quickly adopted across multiple sectors. And we in Washington state have led public sector improvement uh, since the 1980s. Uh, there is the results Washington uh, uh, group that comes out of the governor's office and uh, hosts an annual conference in October that regularly draws uh, over 2,000 participants um, from various state, tribal, and local government um, uh, agencies. Uh, this year's event was a virtual event, and I believe it broke all their previous attendance records. Um, uh, Kent, uh, here at the city of Kent, we count ourselves among the smaller cities with a uh, lean program, uh, but we're in good company. Our neighbors to the north, uh, the city of Renton have a robust uh, lean program, as well as uh, our neighbors uh, over in Squim. Next slide, please. So how do we build a high performance organization? We uh, developed a model to help focus our improvement efforts here at the city. And I just wanted to quickly walk you through some of uh, the key points in this little building that we have uh, developed here. Um, at the top, we have our guiding principles, really looking at uh, bringing together our organization as one Kent, that enterprise alignment um, as one primary principle there, creating internal efficiencies, and of course, moving uh, to a culture of continuous improvement, not always focusing on the ways things have always been done, but really asking how do we improve uh, at the city. So um, at the foundational level, at the bottom there, you can see that lean tools are really going to help set a foundation of knowledge and skills. So Innovate Academy is our internal training program for lean, really helping employees to define problems and implement solutions using a common language and methods. Um, and that foundational level supports the three pillars of our organization. You can think of them as building blocks. Um, we've got systems, culture, and results. Systems really ask the question of how we get the work done. Um, and in this case, we're talking about key business processes, operational activities, and yes, even some IT information systems as well. Technology usually plays a, a part in those processes. Uh, the center pillar is culture, really asking the question, how do we create a culture of continuous improvement? And lean comes from the perspective that no one understands process better 
than employees who work in the process. So then the question becomes, how do we really empower our employees to make regular, uh, ideally daily improvements? And the finer pillar there, results, is really an output of the first two. Um, and it really asks the question, how do we measure our success? How do we quantify uh, metrics for performance? How do we increase value and eliminate waste? And we're always doing this from the customer's perspective. So in, in many cases, we think of our customers as our residents, our business community, but it's also important to remember that we have internal stakeholders, internal customers as well. Very often, uh, departments are handing off information or work product uh, to one another, and we want to make sure that um, everyone who works downstream of a process uh, are seen in a customer light as well. Next slide, please. So uh, last year, we uh, pulled together the advanced team to help support our efforts in improvement and performance. This is a 12-member citywide team. Um, we call it the A-team. And uh, we started gathering in January on a regular basis to learn about lean tools and methods. And uh, then when Corona hit, we, of course, moved to virtual uh, meetings and uh, really felt some urgency around creating some positive change at the organization, really wanted to um, ask ourselves, how can we see change as an opportunity for improvement, even when that change um, is something that has been uh, a little bit forced upon us? Um, and how do we support, support our coworkers and our organization? And so um, we uh, got together and brainstormed some ideas and we came up with some employee webinars. In the next slide, please. Um, really kind of uh, looking at opportunities to engage our employees using a lot of the new technology uh, that we were suddenly dependent on, uh, share some of the lean tools that we were learning about, um, and uh, the response was pretty positive. Staff uh, really enjoyed the opportunity to engage with each other virtually, um, and it also helped us to identify training and knowledge gaps uh, to help maintain a productive workplace. We've uh, been able to use these webinars as a blueprint uh, for other employee training opportunities and other projects this year as well, so that's been very helpful. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, the webinars are a great example of an improvement opportunity that's a just do it, let's get it done and, and learn from it. Uh, but we also have much larger improvement projects. And I wanted to give you a sense of sort of the, the lean methodology of problem solving uh, when we have something larger to tackle. And usually we're looking at uh, a uh, multi multiple department uh, effort here. And so we use the DMAIC phases that's define measure, analyze, improve, and control um, as our approach to problem solving. We ask a lot of questions. We use a lot of lean tools to uncover root causes, not just symptoms. Uh, we wanna make sure that we are addressing the correct problems and have a good solid understanding of our current, uh, uh, current state business process. What's happening now before we implement uh, any uh, improvements down the line. So I wanted to give you a quick look at um, a process map. This is one of our lean tools that we use frequently in the next slide. Um, so this is a process that you may be familiar with. This is the contract routing process. And just as an example, this is one of those processes that uh, due to corona, uh, the coronavirus, we had to make it uh, a fully electronic process relatively quickly. And that resulted in a bit of a patchwork of solutions, which we wanted to further examine. So we mapped out this process at a high level to get a sense of the big picture and also some of the, the details as well. So what did we learn? We uh, looked at a lot of the variables involved, a lot of the sub-processes, and it helps us to identify those interdepartmental handoffs between departments. Uh, where rework loops happen. And often uh, you can see some of the icons there, orange, blue, and pink icons um, that help us identify the manual steps that can either be improved or that can be automated using technology. And we're currently using this process map to help um, run an internal pilot test of routing software with our parks department. Next slide, please. 
So um, I mentioned that uh, electronic contract routing process at the top there, and I'll just mention a few of the other projects that we have currently in flight as well. Um, that second item there, I'm working uh, with ECD, our permit center, and um, they too have had a process that was suddenly made electronic, um, their application intake for permitting uh, process. Um, we met with the permit uh, center team and mapped out their current state uh, process, which was uh, eye-opening because they hadn't had the opportunity to do that, the their new electronic workflow process, and uh, identified a few areas for further analysis. This is really looking at that front application intake piece and looking how we can reduce the time of application intake before it moves to full plan review. Um, with finance, GIS, and public works, really an interdepartmental effort there to um, uh, take a look at impervious surfaces. We're anticipating an aerial uh, analysis uh, completed early next year that will give us a sense of our total citywide inventory of impervious surfaces uh, that are used to calculate commercial drainage charges. So we're looking at that at a, at a high level in terms of what data do we have and what changes have uh, do we expect? And then really um, assembling an interdepartmental team to identify the handoffs and uh, prepare a list of improvements for ELT review. With our Public Works Ops Department, I'm uh, working with uh, our fleet and um, that the fleet team and uh, an external contractor there, uh, consultant there, who um, is currently evaluating vehicle maintenance and, re and replacement process, developing objective criteria for evaluating vehicles. And um, they just completed a uh, review of um, uh, internal uh, fleet customer feedback, uh, which we'll be diving into more later. And their report is expected um, uh, moving forward from the consultant. And then lastly, oh, one more thing to mention uh, on that previous slide. Lastly, I'll mention our um, Care Employee Resource and Advisory Group. This is an employee-led effort really um, looking to examine cultural awareness and racial equity. That's what CARE stands for in this context. And really um, an employee-led effort to uh, provide brave space uh, uh, conversations um, and really kind of getting into our DEI diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, topics, which are so important these days. We hosted two sessions in October, which had 47 participants and received some great feedback. Um, folks uh, really appreciated the opportunity to discuss with their coworkers and asked for more time for discussion. So we are planning um, future sessions in November and December with the CARE group. Next slide, please. So uh, performance measures, uh, as you probably may remember, uh, we discussed at council retreat in fall 2019. I uh, mentioned the importance of connecting our goals, our council goals with our departmental operations. And you may recall uh, that I mentioned, we've got a missing middle there, those dotted lines in the middle. Uh, we really need something to uh, connect those, uh, those two endpoints there. And I mentioned the need for citywide smart objectives, objectives that are specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time bound uh, to fill that gap. And um, that's un we weren't able to tackle that this year in 2020 due to Corona, but we are teeing this project up for 2021 um, at, right now, in fact. And uh, next slide, please. We have many performance measures um, that are already um, displayed in our budget book. And as we move through our busy budget season, I've been working with our senior budget analyst uh, in finance, Kathleen McConnell, and I have been reviewing our existing metrics to be updated in the, uh, the forthcoming budget book. And uh, really, this provides us an opportunity to examine the metrics that we're currently using and ask questions of our data. If we want to manage with data, we have to understand our, the data we already have. And so we're uh, tapping our subject matter experts uh, and data champions and really asking, what does this data mean? Why is it valuable to the public? And uh, how does it help us inform citywide performance? So taking all of our current data into account as we move forward with identifying some smart objectives uh, with ELT into next year. 
And so uh, this last slide here just gives you a sense of some of our next steps with the Advanced Kent program. Really looking to wrap this year up with a review of our uh, existing metrics and then launching into um, that uh, conversation with ELT around uh, developing smart objectives. Continuing to use A-Team as our champions for change, uh, our, our internal advocates for change, um, and, a, and a great think tank, I'll add. Um, and really formalizing our improvement processes, directing staff to a growing list of lean uh, tools uh, that we're uh, increasingly making virtual. So looking forward to continuing to build a culture of improvement at the city. Um, and I'll just close with any questions you may have for me. Great. Thank you, Michael. Lots of good things happening now and in the future. Are there any questions? Council Member Boyce, you have your mic off. Yes, hey, thank you, Michael. I am in a five days value stream mapping class this week here, right? So all the terminology is very familiar, especially the countermeasure and so on. Um, I'd be interested to see um, maybe coming back at this, you know, when you talk about some of your process improvement, maybe bring a, a project back and talk about maybe some of the improvement that you have found in your uh, lean value stream and how you implement those. So uh, I'd be interested to see some of those. Thank you, Council Member. I'd be happy to. Good job. Great suggestion, Council Member Boyce. I like that. Any other questions about this presentation? All right. Great job, Michael. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for your time. All right. Moving on in the agenda, we are on to the 2020 annual docket, which requires action. Hello. I think Kim has a um, a copy of the docket to pull up for us there. And I know that you all received it as well. I'll let her do that. Good evening, esteemed council, mayor, and those all watching from home tonight. My name is Kaylee Nobes, and I'm a long range planner in ECD. I'm here to present to you about our 2020 docket, which is a process that we go through every year. As you're aware, the docket is a combination of requests from the public, as well as suggestions from staff and suggestions from council as to what planners and ECD will be working on for the next calendar year related to our comprehensive plan and zoning amendments. Uh, the lists are not intended to be exhaustive of all of the work that we're going to be completing, um, but the docket does contain some larger items this year. Um, so I'm gonna go through them at a kind of higher level. Uh, the public can submit requests for the docket uh, only once a year, and we only received one public request this year. Um, and then the other uh, amendments are ones that are staff initiated and a city council initiated one. So the first public request is a request for a code amendment to communal residences. Uh, as you might be remembering, we actually just updated this code and um, January or February of 2020. Uh, staff is recommending that we take no further action on this request at this time. I've also contacted the applicant and explained the reasoning why. Um, because we just passed an amendment for this code in 2020, we normally give code a little bit of time to breathe to see how the codes that we've put in place are working, as well as there are some possible changes in upcoming legislature um, in the next couple of years. Uh, we don't want to be preemptive and changing any any more of the code relating to communal residents uh, when there could be some larger changes coming down the pipeline. Um, we'll, we'll end up changing this code every year for the next couple of years. So we're recommending no action on that one. The next public request is, was not made this year is actually was put on hold. It was Oak Point in 2018 uh, comprehensive plan amendment. It was postponed by the applicant due to a potential annexation of Auburn, uh, but that hasn't happened. So the applicant has asked for us to resume our, um, our review and staff is recommending that we do that. Um, we'll come back to council in early 2021 with a recommendation on Oak Point. Uh, the rest of the list, uh, there's a, a, a keeping of animals amendment that was requested by city council to clarify the keeping of roosters in our code. So we've added that to the docket. 
And then we've included park impact fees in the TMP. These are items that we wouldn't normally include in the docket, but we want to make sure we're including them just to kind of make sure that the work program is really transparent. We have to have Oak Point, the TMP, and the park impact fees all go through at the same time due to the um, due to RCW. So you'll be seeing all action on all three of those um, in early 2021. And we also have a space keeping on here for housekeeping amendments. Uh, we always have about one housekeeping amendment a year where we find something that we perhaps need to update. Uh, so we're leaving some space for that as well. So that is all I have for you if you have any questions. Thank you. I do see we have a hand raised by Council Member Michaud. Thank you, Council President. I was just um, wondering if we could expand that rooster item to incorporate chickens. If we can just look at that, I appreciate it. Yes, of course. We have some amendments for chickens on the book, so we'll get in contact with you as to what it is you're um, interested in us looking into for sure. Thank you. Any other uh, questions or comments about this? All right, are there any objections for moving this annual docket forward? All right, we will go ahead and move that forward. Thank you so much, Kayleen. Thank you. Okay, next up on the agenda, we have Mark Jan Meeker, the ESOS Phase Two Multi-Tax Exemption Agreement. This requires action, and I know Jason is going to present, but I would like to welcome our city attorney, Pat Fitzpatrick, to get us started. Hi there, good evening. Good evening, council president and council members. It's nice to see you all. Uh, Jason Garnum will be giving a presentation, but before he does, I'm gonna provide you with a little bit of background on this. So this multifamily housing tax exemption agreement uh, we'll speak about uh, that Mr. Garnum will speak about deals with the former part three golf uh, course site being developed by F and W. It's now referred to at, as ethos. Um, and just as quick background on our ordinance, the city's multifamily housing tax exemption ordinance has existed for many years. And back in 2016, it was amended by the council to include the area which includes the part three golf course uh, property. Um, and so uh, many years ago, uh, regarding the part three golf site, uh, the surplus of that property was largely initiated to ensure the economic viability of the remaining portions of the Riverbend golf course. Um, and if you recall, we had, uh, the city had numerous public uh, meetings to consider whether or not to surplus the property. And after the decision to surplus was made, the city went out with a request uh, for proposals to develop the site and ultimately selected F&W to develop what is now known as the Ethos Project. Um, so after that decision was made on August 15th of 2017, the city entered a development agreement with F&W, the developer, um, and uh, that encompassed all things associated with the sale and development and redevelopment of the Part 3 golf course property. And you, you've all, I think, as council, have dealt with a development agreement in the past. We did one with Blue Origin, for example. Um, but a development agreement is a contract with uh, the developer. It's recorded against the property. Uh, so it runs with the land and it establishes all of the expectations and obligations with regards to, um, in our case, the sale and the development of the property. And um, if you recall, a development agreement requires a public hearing um, before it's adopted by the council. And that public hearing was held on July 18th of 2017. Um, and, and as we know, it was adopted by the council. Um, the 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 DA, the development agreement, designated the property as a residential targeted area, which is a prerequisite to the multifamily housing tax exemption. Um, and the understanding and agreement in the DA was that the property would qualify for that tax exemption and that F&W would be reliant on that uh, multifamily housing property tax exemption in order to have this project basically pencil out from an economic standpoint. 
And that tax exemption provides, um, in our case, an eight-year exemption from the ad valorem taxes, or that's, those are the taxes assessed against the improvements on the property. Um, and it's for redevelopments that meet certain criteria, uh, which I think Jason's going to go over. It's intended to encourage redevelopment in areas where, where development otherwise would be uh, difficult to achieve. Um, it doesn't apply to the value of the property, the land itself, just to the improvements on the property. So that was a specific section of the development agreement that was passed back in uh, 2017. Um, so as you know, this property is being developed in two phases. And the first phase, uh, the multifamily housing tax exemption for phase one on the project was approved by council on November 21st of 2017. And now we're in the, in the throes of phase two. And consistent with the D, uh, the development agreement and the expectations created by that, you have before you the multifamily housing tax exemption agreement for the final phase, phase two of the project. And so I'm gonna, at this point, I'll hand it over to Jason. If you have any questions, I'd, I'd be more than happy to answer them. Anybody have questions for Pat or can we see the presentation and then go from there? All right, go ahead. Let's welcome Jason. Okay, well, good evening, council members, mayor, members of the public, staff. Uh, and thanks, Pat, for, for that introduction. I, I wish you'd, you'd saved me some. Um, so I'm Jason Garnum, a planner in ECD. Um, I, I, most of my work for the city is in uh, development plan review. Um, so you, some of you may, may know me, but you don't see me too often. Um, but in this case, uh, I'm, I'm speaking with you tonight to talk about um, the phase two multifamily tax exemption application for the Marquee on Meeker project. Uh, just a brief overview. Uh, I'm, I'm assuming most of you are quite familiar with it as uh, phase one is, uh, is completed construction and is being occupied um, by new residents. Um, the Marquee on Meeker project uh, is comprised of a total of 492 residential units and includes 12,000 square feet of commercial uh, retail space uh, in addition to numerous public improvements. So this application is for phase two, which is uh, comprised of 210 of those 492 units and half of the commercial space, which is 6,000 square feet. Um, so Patrick uh, described the multifamily tax exemption program of which um, most of you are probably familiar. Um, quick summary, uh, the, the purpose of that program uh, as described in Kent City Code is to increase residential opportunities and stimulate construction of housing in targeted areas. Uh, and as mentioned by Pat, um, this application is for an eight year exemption from uh, taxes on improvement values. Um, this, this exemption does not apply to land value. So property taxes are still paid on the property. Um, and applications were received on both phases of the project separately in uh, 2017. And uh, as mentioned by Pat, uh, the phase one uh, tax exemption is on its way for final recording um, as we speak. Uh, and so I'm um, bringing before you uh, the phase two tax exemption and uh, once signed by the mayor, uh, the contract will give the developer three years to complete construction of those uh, phase two buildings. So Pat mentioned the development agreement. I wanted to just uh, provide a, an overview of uh, some of the, the content. Uh, as mentioned, uh, the multifamily tax exemption was a component of uh, the development agreement. And uh, what, 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 what will that cost the city? Um, you know, we, we estimate that the uh, tax savings for the developer uh, will be approximately $390,000 per year for those eight years. Uh, totaling uh, up to $3.1 million. Uh, ordinarily, the city would keep 12% of this tax. So the estimated reduction in city tax revenue is uh, approximately $48,000 per year. Um, what, what's the city getting for this? Uh, the, their 
project was perceived as bringing many benefits to downtown Kent and the Meeker Corridor and the city as a whole. Um, the, the principal one being that th this project represents uh, over $120 million in investment uh, in at that location. Um, and that includes uh, extensive improvements to Meeker Street. Uh, I, I would add that the uh, Meet Me on Meeker uh, standards that we are administering today for developments on the Meeker Street corridor had not yet been adopted uh, when this project was uh, submitting applications. So agreeing to construct Meeker Street to the standard that you see today, not only along the project frontage, but for the entire width of the street all the way uh, to the sidewalk um, on the golf course side of the street. Um, that was a component of the, of the development agreement. So we got a total of uh, over 1,200 linear feet of uh, above and beyond um, standard improvement uh, street infrastructure. Uh, the developer also agreed to permanently maintain all of the trees and, and landscaping and irrigation within those public areas that's uh, reducing the city's uh, maintenance liability and uh, potentially um, maintaining those improvements at, uh, at a higher standard than, uh, than otherwise. Uh, the developer is also providing uh, uh, several public facilities on the property. Uh, of course, the project abuts the Green River and the Green River Trail. So uh, they're providing two uh, paved pathways uh, to the river through the site. Uh, those are protected in public access easements so the public will forever for the life of the project be able to access the Green River Trail by walking or riding bicycles uh, or using other wheeled devices through the site. Um, and they're also providing public parking spaces for Green River Trail access. Uh, in, in addition to that, uh, the project, uh, they agreed to hold a higher standard for the improvements, uh, both on the interior of the units and the exterior of the buildings, um, of those standards exceeding what is required by the zoning code or the international building code. So that relates to some of the finishes uh, of, of the buildings and um, the apartment units, things like stainless steel and granite countertops and you know all the schnazzy things we like to see. Um, in addition to that, uh, the project will begin uh, or is already providing tax revenue uh, in the form of the increased land value uh, that um, was a byproduct of converting the property from public park use to, to uh, private development use. And lastly, uh, I did want to point out that uh, this project was intended to serve as a, a gateway to Meeker Street and to Kent's downtown and to also function as a catalyst for attracting other projects in the area. Uh, and you know, by, by fulfilling and implementing those um, requirements and conditions of approval, uh, improving the walkability of, uh, of the area in Kent, uh, increasing transit use, hopefully, uh, and perhaps most importantly, bringing uh, a number, at least 492, uh, new residents uh, to downtown Kent to support our, our businesses and institutions. Uh, so, you know, in summary, uh, we're, what we're asking for is for council to authorize the mayor to sign the contract for the multi, uh, multifamily housing tax exemption application for phase two of this project. Uh, and that concludes my, my, my presentation. I'll be glad to try to answer any questions if you have any. Thank you. Jason, thank you very much. Councilmember Lerner has her hand raised. Thank you. Yeah, so I have a, a question. You had mentioned that there was, um, there was a $48,000 loss per year of revenue to the city, but that property was not taxed. On, the development wasn't taxed prior to this development, correct? So is there really a loss? Yes, that that's my understanding. Um, the as a as the par three golf course, um, the the property did not generate any tax revenue for the city. Okay, thank you, Councilmember Fincher. 
Thank you, Madam President. I just wanted to reiterate that this is the agreement that we settled on back in 2017 when the project first came forward. So what we're doing is just carrying forth, doing what we said we were going to do. This is not something new that's being added on to the agreement. Thank you, Councilmember Fincher. I appreciate that comment. Councilmember Boyce. Thank you very much. Uh, I can remember this uh, project from day one, right? I, I would encourage my council member, if you haven't had a moment to go out there and talk to John McKenna and uh, walk around and visit that project. I mean, this is like first class. I mean, there's no shortcuts and uh, John would be happy to walk you around and you can go visit some of the uh, uh, the units and uh, really, and I have talked to some of the tenants there, right? It just really, it just way over top. Uh, it's gonna be really good as our gateway uh, for Kent through Mika. It's just totally, totally impressed with that. So I would encourage my council member, if you haven't, take a moment, go out and give John a call and go visit. He's really happy to brag and, and, and show this place around. So thank you. Thank you, council member Boyce. Um, I just have one question. Um, Obviously, you know, Councilmember Boyce talks about how well the project is going and it looks like it's being well received. Um, how is it going as far as renting the units? I think you said right now in phase one, there's about 210 units. Uh, so phase, sorry, uh, if that wasn't clear, phase two is for 210 units. Uh, so phase one would be 282 units. And um, I did speak with the developer a couple of weeks ago and, and we talked casually about how um, renting those units was going. I can't remember an exact number. Um, so I apologize. I, I, I can try to get one for you if you'd like, but he, he said it's going as well as they, as they would have expected. Um, and um, my understanding too was that uh, meeting certain targets uh, for renting those units was um, on their end a requirement for obtaining financing to construct the buildings for the second phase. So uh, the fact that they're moving forward with this is a good sign that, that things are going as they intended. Great, thank you. Any other questions or comments from my colleagues? All right, so again, I think Council Member Fincher mentioned this. This is just to move forward with uh, what you did on phase one into phase two. So are there any objections to moving this forward? All right, wonderful. Thank you so much. Thanks, Jason, appreciate it. Thank you all for your time and have a great night. All right, and we will move that forward to the consent calendar. Next up, um, I'd like to welcome Paula again. This is a um, motion by the council for write-offs of uncollected accounts. Good evening, Council President Troutner, members of City Council, and Mayor Ralph. This is my first of several opportunities to come before you tonight. Um, and in this case, I'm actually asking to write off uncollectible accounts of $85,034.25. This represents about 1% of our total outstanding account receivable balances. This is made up of um, approximately uh, just over $56,000 of unpaid violations and fines, um, about $18,500 in miscellaneous permits, taxes, and fees, nearly $9,000 in miscellaneous public work repairs, and about $1,300 in other program fees. And it also represents activity that's happened between 2007 and 2016, primarily made up of activity invoices uh, from 2016. Um, the finance department has a procedure that we follow related to our write-offs and any delinquent balance that we have that um, is older than three years. So the invoice is older than three years, not counting this current year, which is why we're looking at 2016. These will be written off. Now, writing these off does not mean that we cannot collect and receive those monies. It just really is cleaning up our books. This is something that we do at the end of every fiscal year um, as part of our uh, processes. For those accounts that are in collections, so long as we retain the backup for uh, the backup documents for those activities, those accounts will remain in collections. And so this is what I have for you tonight. 
Thanks, Paula. Anyone have questions for Paula on this? All right. Any objections for moving this forward to <clears throat> I have a question. Sorry. Yes, yeah, ahead, Council Member Thomas. <clears throat> Thank you, Apollo. Um, so at the end, you were talking about some are being collection and some are being written off, or is that total together? So what this is, those that are, that's total altogether. Some of them are in collection. Some of them are not. Some of them are not eligible for collection. So therefore we can't turn them over for collections. Um, and so, but the ones that are eligible and have been turned over are in collections and they will remain in collections. I see. And what is the reason whether they cannot go into collection? Well, it would just depend on some of the activities. So, for example, some of the items that are not in collection would include things like um, permits that were withdrawn or, or canceled. So we had done a billing for it and it's no longer a valid thing or they were right. the permit was expired. Um, also, if there was an error that had occurred that would not be able to substantiate. And then finally, if we don't have the backup documentation, we are not allowed to send them to collection. So if for some reason that has been uh, misplaced, that would cause the uh, problem as well. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions for Paula? All right, so any objections to moving this to consent? All right, we will move that on to the consent calendar. Next, we will move on to Lifeline Utility Ordinance Update. Good evening, President Troutner, Council Members, and Mayor Ralph. My name is Molly Bartlemy. I'm the Customer Service Manager, and tonight I'll be going over some updates to our Lifeline Utility Ordinance. Um, on the agenda, we'll start by going over program eligibility, some minor technical edits we've made to the ordinance. Our biggest change is our rate structure change kind of what's next on our plans for Lifeline, and then I'll open it up to any questions. So our Lifeline program is our discount utility program um, for water, sewer, and drainage utilities. To be eligible for the program, you need to, excuse me, You need to meet the household, in, your household income cannot exceed the low income limits set by HUD. It needs to be your principal place of residence. And in addition to those items, you need to meet one of the following. You need to be over the age of 62, unable to work due to total and permanent disability, or providing care to a child with a total and permanent disability. The minor technical edits that we have in the ordinance are changing the consumer price index to Seattle Tacoma Bellevue. It's currently uh, Seattle Tacoma Bremerton, and there was a change made to that. We want to clarify that the utility account should be in the name of the applicant, and this ensures that we are being good stewards of the program and able and able to monitor to make sure that the right households are getting the discount. And we also uh, are changing the ordinance to better align with those um, income guidelines from HUD. And what that really is is changing our ordinance to say from adjusted gross income to gross income. When we look at the income limits for this program, uh, the nice thing about the city of Kent is that we use low income limits opposed to very low income. So most of our surrounding cities for their eligibility, you need to be in that very low income. So for example, to a family of four can make $95,250 a year and still be eligible for our program, which is a really great thing. So this really opens up our program to a lot of our residents. Our biggest change tonight is uh, how we actually have our rates set for the Lifeline program. So they're currently a flat rate. What we're proposing to do is to do a 60% discount to city water and sewer charges and a 90% discount to our drainage charges. Why we came up with this idea is we want to be more consistent with our neighboring cities. When we look at our surrounding jurisdictions, they all use a percentage discount. The discount percentage varies. Most commonly we see about a 50% discount. 
And these these uh, 60 percent, 90 percent discounts, those were chosen because they closely match what we currently are billing. So we definitely did not want to see any large increases to any of our customers. These changes also keep our rates sustainable. So these rates will slowly increase over time and eliminate having to do a huge increase in the future um, and really surprise some of our customers. We don't want to have to be in a position where we have to do a big increase. And then it also eases managing this program. So these rates are, again, are set to just increase over time. It makes it very clear what our discounts are when we make those changes to our rates every year. It's very clear what the amount is gonna be and it's very clear when we communicate those rates to our customers. So to look at what these actual rates look like. So in our first column, we have our residential rates for 2021, our standard rates. Uh, the second column, we're going to look at what our proposed rates are with those percentage discounts. And in the last column, we have what our current lifeline rates are. So we'll start with drainage. So a single family home in 2021 is going to pay $13.16 a month for drainage charges. And this is one of those rates that really hasn't been increased in a long time. So even with a 90% discount to our current rates, our customers are going to see a little bit of an increase there. When we look at city sewer, the standard rate's $25.69, and our proposed discount will bring the rate to $10.28. And so our customers are actually gonna see a little discount on this rate. Um, our meter charge fee, which is also referred to as, as an access fee, uh, the current rate for our, life, our Lifeline customers is $13.10, and the new proposed rate is $9.98. So again, it's gonna be a nice savings. Uh, the, most, the majority of our customers are either have a five eighths or three quarters meter, we do have some customers with a one inch meter. Um, I looked today and as far as kind of how many customers, it's less than 3% of our Lifeline customers do have this larger meter. So their charges would actually go up a little bit. Uh, the other item is your water usage. So the city of Kent has a tiered rate structure for usage. So your first eight units are billed at a lower rate. Anything over that is billed at a higher rate. Our current Lifeline program doesn't have that tiered rate structure. So this, how we have it currently proposed, they will start to see that tiered rate. So again, the first eight units a month are billed at a lower rate. Most of our customers, um, their water meters are red every other month. So it's actually the first 16 units are billed at that lower rate. And when we look at you know, how many of our Lifeline customers would actually go into that second tier, uh, we went ahead and looked at our July and August billings, kind of those times of the year when we see customers tend to use higher usage. Um, and less than 25% of our customers would actually go into that second tier and pay those um, second tier rates. So if we look at kind of a, a standard customer example, so this would be a customer that has um, water, sewer, and drainage billed by the city of Kent and uses kind of average water usage. So we'd use 13 units. And again, this is somebody that's read bi-monthly. So those 13 units are all uh, at the lower tier. So this customer uh, would see a slight increase of about 45 cents, again, with about average water usage. If we look at the next slide, we'll see what that customer would be billed on a base rate month. So six months out of the year, the customer isn't paying that water usage, they're just paying our base rates. Um, and those months, they're actually gonna see a discount because of that uh, reduced price and the sewer and meter charges, they're actually seeing about a discount of about $5 a month. So really, when we look at the whole year, somebody that uses you know, average water is going to see about a $28 savings when you kind of level it throughout the year. Uh, not all of our customers are billed water, sewer, and drainage. Depending on where you live in the city uh, determines what uh, water sewer and drainage charges you have. So the city of Kent bills drainage on all single family residences, but we do have some other water and sewer providers in the city. So the first example is a customer that's billed drainage and sewer from the city of Kent, and that customer would see about a $2 savings a month. We also have customers that are only billed storm drainage. Uh, those customers are billed quarterly, and those customers would see a slight increase. Uh, when you look at that increase, um, the total increase over the year is less than $5. 
When we look at what's next for our program, one thing customer service is doing right now is updating our Lifeline application form. Um, it's great because our account reps are really involved in this, this, and they're the ones that are kind of that front end and really work with the customers that apply. And what we find is a lot of times that customers don't fill out the application fully and they don't attach their eligibility documents. So our goal is to get as many customers on this program as we can and make it clear as possible what's required to be on the program. Um, other items is we wanna make sure that we're promoting this program. If these changes go into effect, they go into effect January 1st. Uh, we bring out a new rate brochure every January that's included in all of our utility statements. So we'd wanna make sure that these lifeline changes are very uh, clear and clearly highlighted on our rate brochure. We don't think customers are gonna really notice a change, but we really wanna make sure that it's clear that this change is taking place. We also know that we've got some room to do additional communication and notification about this program. We think we have a lot of residents out there that would qualify. They're just not aware of this program. So I think we've got some work to do to let our customers know about this program. We currently have about 550 customers on this program, uh, but we think that there's more out there. So at this time, I'm happy to open it up to any questions. Great, thank you. Any questions on this? Councilmember Cor. Thank you, Molly, for the presentation. Uh, just a quick question. So the rates are going in effect in January. Uh, I guess part of the communication, are there uh, maybe some of the customers are impacted by COVID? So I, I don't know if we have, we do have resources for them, but I, I mean, is this is this something that is going to be taken into account before their rates are going to go up? Yeah, our, our, definitely our hope is that most of the customers on this program aren't seeing an increase. But I think with items like COVID, there could be more customers out there that are eligible to receive this discount. Maybe now their income is in that bracket. So I think it's one of those things that kind of goes hand in hand um, is getting this information out there to see if there's more customers that are eligible for this program. Thank you. Just just to follow up, and are the plans to promote this program in various languages? I, I don't know if you know the answer to that. Um, you know, I don't know that, but I'll certainly make note of that. I think that's a, a huge item for us to address and to make sure we get it out to as many customers as possible. Thank you. All right. Any other questions for Molly on this? Okay, so before you, you have the motion to adopt this um, Lifeline Utility Ordinance update. Are there any objections to moving this forward? All right, we will move this forward to the consent calendar. Thank you very much. Thank you. Moving on, we have Michelle Ferguson will talk about consolidating budget adjustments, and this is for July 1st through September 30th. And this also requires action from council. Good evening, Council. I'm Michelle Ferguson, the Financial Planning Manager, and I'll be presenting the third quarter budget adjustments. So the overall, um, the budget, this budget adjustment is a little unusual due to the fact that it's an overall net budget reduction. This third quarter adjustment is reflecting an overall budget decrease of $4,338,400. Previously, Approved increases total $42,910, and budget adjustments that have not been approved by council include an increase of $2,818,790 and a decrease of $7,200,100, which is a net total of $4,381,310. The budget increases that have already been approved total $42,910. And these two grants are for the police department and one is for a King County sex offender grant and the other is for a Waspic traffic, traffic equipment grant. So the budget increases that have not been approved by council total $2,818,790. The budget increases include a $680,750 increase for the YMCA project. This was done in order to finalize the YMCA lease payoff and get the project ready to close. 
Um, 680,000 was transferred from the capital resources fund to the project, and then 680,000 was budgeted as an expense in the project. So altogether, those total $1.36 million. A $675,000 budget increase was needed for the Fleet Fuel Island project. $425,000 was transferred out of the capital resources fund and two hundred and fifty dollars from the Fleet Fuel fund, Fleet Fund. For and altogether, six hundred and fifty was budgeted in the project for a total of one point three five million dollars. An additional thirty three thousand was budgeted in the business license payment integration project, and those funds came from the IT Tech Plan funds. Uh, a little over twenty seven thousand was moved from the twenty eighteen sewer relining project and into a new sewer relining project. Um, and if you remember, in twenty eighteen, sewer was in a different fund; it was combined with drainage. And so, this is just part of um, moving the sewer project into its own fund. A twelve thousand dollar budget increase was needed for the shop's parking lot security project in order to get that project fully funded and ready to close. $12,000 was transferred out of the utility operating funds, and then $12,000 was budgeted in the project for a total of $24,000 in budget changes. And lastly, $23,200 was budgeted in the Kent's Event Center operating fund to reflect rebates that Shower received from Puget Sound Energy for a light project. So the big one is um, budget decreases that have not been approved by council for $7,200,100. Um, a very small 13,000 in expenses were decreased in the general fund due to a shift on how we budget the sound transit positions. If you remember in the 2020 mid biennium budget, uh, it included the cost of four sound transit positions in the general fund with a 95% offset to the sound transit projects. Um, and it was assumed that about 5% of their costs would stay in the general fund. Since then, it has been decided that the positions could be moved out of the general fund and budgeted solely in the project. So that extra 5% that was in the general fund can be removed, which equates to about $13,000. And the bulk of it, the over $7 million has been reduced in various different funds to reflect the negative impacts of COVID-19. Um, the general fund has reduced uh, over $5.6 million in salaries and benefits and supplies and services. The special revenue funds, almost $800,000. Uh, capital projects funds, $50,000. The enterprise funds, nearly $200,000. And the internal service funds, $529,000. Are there any questions? All right, any questions for Michelle? It's, yeah, I got, yeah, thank you, Madam President. So the $7 million, is, is that's what was received, I'm lost, so I, I'm, I'm, that's what received from COVID? That's what we have re reduced due to COVID. In the um, second quarter budget adjustment, we had done some increases um, when we have shifted some of salaries and benefits to other funds. And then this is the result of all the reductions. So um, the layoffs, the furloughs, um, the reduced salaries and supplies and services budgets. So with both of those um, in mind, so what is the, the delta, I guess? The, the net is about uh, $6 million overall for the city has been reduced. So that, that that's a plus to the city budget, yes. right? Yes. Okay. Okay, and, and that plus is um, that that become part of the general fund or what? Uh, the general fund is that five point six million dollars. Um, there was no increase to the general fund, so the the numbers that you see on the screen that's the full reduction to the general fund. It was the other funds that had seen some increases, um, like the internal service funds, some um, like the enterprise funds, some salaries and benefits got moved. Mm -hmm. into those funds. And so it increased slightly. We moved some um, into the internal service funds, into the medical fund. We moved some uh, position costs in there as well for about $263,000. So th those were the increases that we did before, but we had to wait until, um, you know, severances and things like that uh, had gone through before we could do the reductions. Now, is the COVID fund, is, how long do we have? It's to the end of the month, right? Is it in the November or October we had to spend? Oh. The, the CARES funding, yeah, so that's a separate project for the five, $5.8 million, and we have until the end of November to spend those funds. 
Gotcha. Okay, thank you for the clarity. Council Member Core. Thank you. Uh, Michelle, uh, so uh, my question, I guess, Councilmember Boyce already asked, but part of it is, uh, are we seeing these um, budget decreases or uh, savings because of part partly spending CARES funding? Um, uh, the the care the cares funding um, is sitting in a in a project so that it, th these are two separate things so these are the ones that you're seeing on the screen is reductions because of personnel um, that we have had to cut and the, the cares funding is uh, charging things um, like the laptops and the economic things and those are in the the project. Okay, so we're not charging salaries or any of the services and things to CARES funding? Uh, not yet. There, um, whatever we can't spend by the end of the month, the, we will charge um, payroll costs for public safety. So basically, um, you know, police officers cost to that project to make sure that we hit that 5.8 million that we can get reimbursed for, for from the state. Okay. So um, these, these funds will stay in their respective, I guess, in, in special revenues fund and enterprise fund, they'll stay where they are. We're not moving them. Anymore. No, no, the, these savings are um, for these these different funds. They We're not gonna use the savings for anything else. That's why we, we reduced the budget so that they can be spent on anything else. Yeah, I think my, my question was basically like, um, yeah, we're seeing savings and I know that we CARES funding is separate, but my kind of the question was like, I. I I guess we're seeing larger savings due to the fact that, yeah, we had um, layoffs and furlough, but also because we received CARES funding. So it helped us be that much ahead than where we would, we would have been if we had no CARES funding. Most of the other things that have been charged to the CARES funding, um, we wouldn't have bought if we didn't have that funding. We wouldn't have spent the two million dollars on economic development out of the out of the general fund. This is Paula Painter, finance director. Would it be okay if I jump in for just a moment? Yes, Paula, that would be great. I appreciate it. Yeah, I think that right now we're actually confusing two different elements here. What Michelle has in front of you right now is really the reduction, that big, huge budget exercise we did back in May where we did all of the budget reductions. Budget reductions could not get put into the system until all employees were gone who were going to be leaving the city. That helped us to be able to figure out what we could save. That happened in July, which means that you guys are now July falls into that third quarter phase. So you're now seeing the numbers here. There isn't any tie between the COVID, uh, the CARES dollars and what you're seeing on the screen. They're two very separate um, things. And I think that there's a little bit of intermingling of them that might be going on. Um, it is a little bit confusing that you're seeing the COVID-19 budget reduction exercise now, but really it had to do with the timing of when we could put those into the system. To Council Member Kaur's, um uh, questions about the dollars that are from the CARES funding. Those are being tracked completely separate. They are within a project where we're keeping those dollars completely separate from everything that you are seeing on the screen at this point in time. And so I recorded that answer a question or do you have follow up? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Paula. I, I understand that completely. I was just kind of trying to basically uh, that we are charging like public safety or some of the things to CARES funding. So just kind of like, you know, I just I'll, I'll do it offline. I'll ask you, Paul, I'll talk about it later with you. Thank you. Okay, I'd be happy to meet with you for sure. Thank you. All right, any other questions for Michelle? All right, so the motion before you is for these budget adjustments. Any um, objections to moving this forward to the consent calendar? All right, we will move that forward. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. Next on the calendar is item, we are on item O, which is payment of bills. Everyone receives that through email. So if there's no objections, we will move that forward to consent. 
And then next, Paula will welcome you back for the ordinance adopting the 2126 Capital Improvement Plan. Great, thank you so much for having me back. So there is an ordinance in front of you right now that would amend the capital facilities plan, or excuse me, the capital facilities element of the Kent Comprehensive Plan to include the 2021-2026 Capital Improvement Program. Um, this capital improvement program is a required component um, of the Growth Management Act, which was enacted in 1990. Um, part of this requirement requires that the city create a six-year plan. When you look in the budget book, you'll see a um, section that does outline the city's um, six-year capital improvement plan. The plan um, does provide for um, financing sources to be able to cover projects that would help to meet the needs to continue to maintain the established levels of service that, um, that we have. Um, and what the ordinance does um, for, for you would be to also um, update the city's comprehensive plan. So what you're going to find is to the activities on that um, capital improvement plan for 2021 and 22 have been included in the budget. Um, the other items from 2023 through 26 is our plan for the remaining years. Um, there is additional information on that six-year capital improvement plan, which begins on page 69 of the mayor's proposed budget book. Do you guys have any questions? Paula, any questions for Paula? Okay, so before you, this is for the um, ordinance to adopt the 2126 capital improvement plan. Any objections to moving this forward to consent? All right, we will move that to the consent calendar. Thank you, Paula. Up next, we have an ordinance amending the comprehensive plan and its capital facilities element to include school district capital facilities plans. And welcome to Haley. Hi there, this is Haley Bonsteel, Long Range Planning Manager. Having some internet connectivity issues today, so I'm gonna stay off the video, uh, but hopefully y'all can hear me. Um, I'm actually gonna present on the next two items, if you don't mind, since they're combined uh, in my mind, <laughs> anyway. Uh, and that's about the school district impact fees. So every year we uh, adopt our um, school district's capital facilities plans into our comprehensive plan and uh, adopt new impact fees for their requests. So uh, we had a public hearing on this a few weeks ago and uh, this is just bringing that forward. So I'll just hit on a bit, cute, few quick things, excuse me, including that uh, enrollment was not quite as down for our school districts this year as it was the year before, but uh, some up, some down, no shocking numbers there. Um, obviously, there's some ongoing construction projects within the Federal Way School District uh, in the Star Lake, Twin Lake area, and um, I just got some kudos uh, to our planning department and, um, and development engineering folks for their assistance with that from some staff who were here earlier but had to jump off, so it sounds like those projects are going well. Uh, impact fees this year, um, we had, again, two of our school districts trip that multifamily max. So we are continuing to escalate our, our cap on multifamily uh, uh, impact fees by the construction cost index increase. So that went up to a little over $9,000 this year. And um, just a note that Highline School District did not submit this year. Pre last year they submitted but didn't request an impact fee for the first time because of declining enrollment. So it's not surprising that they didn't submit a plan this year. I have a feeling that they are kind of uh, reorganizing north of our borders and focusing their efforts there. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. All right, so we have two motions ahead of us. Anybody have questions for Haley on either item Q or R? All right, so we have the ordinance to amend the comprehensive plan and it's capital facilities to include school district, capital facilities, and then we also have the ordinance to adopt updated school impact fees. Any objection to moving these two items forward to consent? All right, seeing none, we will move those forward. Thank you, Haley. You're so welcome, thanks. And I'm, I, Brenda Fincher has a question in the chat. I'm just gonna answer it in there. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We are getting closer to the end of our agenda, so thank you everyone for staying with us. 
Um, up next, Chad Varian is going to talk about the ordinance adopting the comprehensive plan amendment to incorporate the water system plan into the facilities element. Welcome. Good evening. Uh, I think I represent just over 1,300 pages of the 1,700 page agenda. So I feel like I should start with an apology tonight. Uh, again, uh, I think you talked about this last time, just a housekeeping item to include the water system plan uh, in the comprehensive plan. If, I, if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you, Chad. I appreciate that. I know that um, they, this um, agenda, I believe, is over 1,700 pages. So thanks for that clarification. Um, anybody have any questions for Chad? All right, any objections to moving this item forward to consent? All right, we will do so. Thank you. All right, the next three items that we have left on the agenda are, um, let's see, we have the property tax um, substantial need resolution. So Paula, you have the next three, so we will take them all one at a time. Fantastic, thank you for having me back. So um, in front of you right now is a resolution for substantial need related to our property tax. So what this is, as you know, property tax growth is limited by 1% above our levy um, collections from the year before plus new construction. Or it is the lesser of the implicit price deflator. If that comes in below 1%, we naturally go to the um, in implicit price deflator. By bringing this substantial need resolution forward, this gives us the uh, um, opportunity to continue at that 1% increase. So although state law does, um, does um, provide us with this opportunity, the resolution is needed to be count passed by council. As many of you know, year after year, the city continues to face a structural imbalance as revenues continue to grow at a slower pace than our expenditures. Um, the uh, biggest impact on this is this 1% limitation that has been in place um, related to our property tax. Um, so currently the um, Implicit price indicator that we would be using would allow us to in increase our property tax by six tenths of 1% instead of 1%. That would be um, about $125,000 less than we would be able to do at that full 1%. The budget that's been put before the council, the proposed budget, includes a 1% increase within that proposed budget. And based on the need that the city continues to face year after year, I bring forth to you the substantial need resolution um, and, and um, ask for your consideration for that. Thank you. Thanks, Paula. Does anyone have any questions on this for Paula? All right, any objections for moving this forward to consent? Okay, we will move that onto the consent calendar. Next up, we have the property tax levy ordinance, which requires action as Paula, you are muted, I'm sorry. Sorry about that. Um, so uh, next slide, please. In front of you is the property tax ordinance. As you can see, we have estimated in the 2021 assessed valuation for um, uh, the assessed values within Kent. Those assess that assessed valuation is closely aligned with uh, King County. We are still waiting for some final numbers from them to be able to get that um, in place. With a an estimate of a 5% increase on home values, um, what we're seeing is that our levy weight rate would actually decrease by 1.2, excuse me, two, 1.34%. Um, that would then result in the median home value, um, which currently is at $381,000 in the city of Kent, would result in uh, the Kent's share of property tax coming to $539. Um, do you have any questions about this, about this ordinance that's in front of you? Anyone have any questions about this? 
Council Member Weiss, you have your mic off. Did you have a question? And that's uh, 539, and, and that's per year. That's, and that's the value, the new value of the house, from 525000 to 539000 No, is that? that is, the value of the house is at, um, for 2020, is at 381000 We're estimating that it will increase by 5%. By applying the um, levy rate to that, it would be the Kent only share. Remember on your property tax, not only do you pay for the Kent share of property tax, but you're also paying for school districts mm -hmm. and right. other, other um, jurisdictions. So the Kent's portion is actually $539 per per year per year okay that's what i was gonna ask okay good all right any questions other questions or comments okay any objection to moving this forward to consent all right thank you and that brings us to the last item on our agenda which is the ordinance to adopt the 2122 biennial budget which requires action by council all right, well, I am very excited to bring this forward to you guys tonight. This has certainly been quite a journey. This journey started uh, quite a while ago, back in August, I believe we first came together, um, uh, the council all came together and talked with administration and the mayor about what was important to them is what they wanted to see in the biennial budget. Um, the mayor did get her biennial budget presented to everyone at the end of September and following that we have had many discussions, several workshops um, to talk about this budget and to um, um, be able to get to a point where we can bring it forward. And I um, really appreciate many of the conversations that we've had along the way. Next slide, please. Overall, the 2021-22 budget is going to see expenditures of approximately um, uh, 688 million dollars that's combined for both years uh, for 2021 we're looking at a total gross budget of nearly 340 million dollars of which 107 million is the general funds in addition in 2022 the expenditures are at uh, 348 0.5 million dollars um, and the general fund is at 110.7 million dollars Next slide, please. There are a lot of things that we can talk about with this budget, a lot of great things that went on here, but I thought that I would just take a few minutes to highlight some of the things that not only came out of the discussions that we had um, through those workshops, um, discussions with council um, and the mayor about the police and data consultant, um, the co-responder program and behavioral health. Those are things that were added be, um, after the um, proposed budget was put out there. In addition, with the budget itself, the equity manager position was um, added to that budget as well as an economic opportunity fund. Some other things that weren't included on this slide, which I, I think um, deserve a additional recognition is the Human Services Opportunity Fund, which is going to go into effect in 2022 at $100,000 and uh, $40,000 to the Greater Kent Historic Society funding. Um, in addition to that, um, this budget also included a new revenue stream, and that revenue stream is that outdoor square footage tax. That was passed. Part of those revenues were used to fund the Economic Development Opportunity Fund. In addition, it was able to be able to uh, use a portion of that to finance some of our capital projects. And in the in the realm of capital projects. This after or earlier today, um, you received an update on the cleanup work that's been going out on Mill Creek in Mill Creek Canyon. And in this budget also includes the revitalization, some revitalization work for Mill Creek, um, Kent Memorial Park renovation, street overlays, just to name a few. Um, so before you, I'm really happy to um, place the 2021-2022 biennial budget in front of you. And I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you so much, Paula. I just wanna make a comment. Um, 
you know, the mayor, as you mentioned, uh, presented her budget to the council on September 29th. Um, and then at that point, it became council's budget to work through. And I just want to thank all of my colleagues for the amount of time you put into going through that budget. Um, we kept talking about doing your homework and making sure you got your questions answered. And you all put a lot of thought into it. And I think it's reflected in um, this current budget and in the highlights that um, are on this slide that we're looking at right now. So also thank you to all the department directors that spent a large amount of time making sure we got answers to all of our questions. So I'm extremely proud to be able to move this budget on um, at the next meeting. And if there's no objections, I'll allow you to have time to comment, but um, I would like to move it to other business. So um, at that time, you will all have your chance to say something as well as you, if you'd like. So any questions about this particular um, presentation from Paula? Council Member Boyce. Yes, could, Paul, just real quickly, could you go back to the previous page? You turn it so quickly, I just wanna take a quick look at it. Give me about five seconds to take a look here. Okay, all right, thank you. All right, any other questions or comments? All right, so as I mentioned, if there's no objection, I'd like to move this forward to the next council meeting under other business. Council Member Larmer. Yeah, sorry, just noticed something. I just wanna be specific. So on the very last line here, we say behavioral health, but it was uh, youth, it was specific to youth. So I just wanna make sure that's understood. Okay. Yes. Sorry about that. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Lammer. All right, any other comments? All right, any objections? Wonderful. Thank you again for all of your hard work, everyone. Um, this has been a very long process, but a very good one. And um, with that, that brings us to the end of our very long agenda this evening. Um, thank you for um, spending time with us so we can get through some of these important topics. Um, tomorrow is Veterans Day, so I would like to thank all of our veterans who have served our country. Um, enjoy your evening, and thank you for joining us. Have a good night, everyone. Take care.